So hi, everybody, and welcome to Crew Call. Today's guest is Debbie Liebling, a veteran of the industry, comedy development legend, helped bring South Park to the world, as you can see on her back wall there. Um, welcome, Debbie. Hi, thanks for having good me. Have, it's good to have you. Pleasure. So let's get started with just a brief overview of your career. How'd you get started? Um, I got started by, you know, just sort of getting coffee for people and being an assistant. And I, my first uh, job was in New York at a public television station as an assistant to someone in the fundraising division, which I, you know, was not at all interested in that aspect of it, but it was a foot in the door. And obviously times have changed a lot since then, but um once I was in the door, I was in the building, and that's still a good tip we can talk about later. Um, I was able to maneuver toward the things that I wanted, which was producing and production and c- content creation. And so um, public television was very, very well funded at the time, particularly in New York City. And so I was able to, you know, they would post jobs internally internally. And then I had first access so I could go meet the person who was looking. And then I transitioned. Um, I gave myself like six months and said, if I can't kind of do find something in this place within the next six months, I'm out because I don't want to answer phones for the lady who takes people out to lunch for fundraising. And Mm -hmm. so, um, but getting in the door was, was half the battle and often is half the battle because once you're in there, you can start to identify And that can be a big company or a small production company, but getting in the door is half the battle because once you're in, you can sort of, then you can start building relationships and just saying to people, I'm interested in this. And most people are interested in working with someone who's interested in what they're doing. So that was my first thing. And then I moved on from there to MTV when it was cool in New York, um, (laughs) uh, in the early days of MTV, really. And, um, and that was another sort of right place, right time, because people, we were all very young in our early 20s and um, thrust into a, kind of a startup that blew up within like a three-year span. And so all of us who were there, just like it was trial by fire, like we were producing, directing, editing, just like go, 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 because no one expected it to be that. So we all got sort of brought along with the tide. And um, that whole generation, we were very well positioned to break into Hollywood at that point, those of us who wanted to go to LA and really pursue uh, the kind of content that I wanted to pursue. And so um, it was, again, luck. There was a lot of luck involved in that one. You know, right place, right time can can really do a lot because everyone in Hollywood thought, oh, those MTV people, they're so cool. They know what they're doing. I was like, we do not really. But but okay, if you think so. Uh, And then I got recruited to produce a a show in LA. And then I just moved here and from there just started producing. And then I um, was producing a lot of comedy. And then I got, then Comedy Central started And some of the same people from MTV were transferred over there. And then they called me and asked me to open an office on the West Coast. And I did. And that's when I bought South Park, literally like the first week. And that was just like a completely random, you know, oh, this is funny. We don't have anything. It's a brand new network. Let's try this. And that was a really good thing for the network. And so um, the network kind of blew up and I ran it for a long time. And then from there, um, I had a lot of comedy experience. So I was recruited by 20th Century Fox, the movie studio, to kind of help kickstart their, re-kickstart their comedy business. They were having, struggling a little bit in the comedy feature area. And so I went over and ran that and had a bunch of very successful movies under the Fox banner that, um, convince them that I might know something about comedy and and then they gave me another division called Fox Atomic 
um, short-lived but fun. And then I left there and went to run production at Universal um, Pictures, where I was involved in a lot of really wonderful films and comedies there. And then I sort of burnt out on the corporate world. So I decided I wanted to get back to producing, making things, um, and not dealing with corporate politics as much. And so I partnered with Ben Stiller, ran his company for five years, um, and then um, recently partnered with Sam Raimi, and we have a TV company together, and I also produce a lot of comedy independently and movies and everything. So now I get to just, I'm just lucky I get to work on stuff that kind of I think is cool. So that's that's the prize at the end of the rainbow, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> which is great. Tell me about building relationships, because that seems to be kind of a through line in your story. And you mentioned that early on, you know, identifying those folks who want to do the things you're doing and building relationships with them. Yeah. Can, you, can you give folks some insight into, into yeah. that? Yeah. And the thing that's great, especially if, I don't know if you are all students together, but that is the best place to start whenever I speak to people who are, who are colleagues. And even if you're not students together and you're students with other people, creating community is so important um, because let's say one of you is a writer, one of you wants to be a director, one of you wants to be a producer. Well, then, then three of you should just get together and make something because, um, and then as people, so like one friend will get their toe in the door and then they bring their group along with them. Uh, there's this group of people um, that I work have been working with since I met these two guys who were, had just graduated from NYU film school and I was really impressed with their stuff and I developed something I did two series with them and because of them I met like every single person they brought all their friends on the show and then then the, then one of their friends went hey I wrote a screenplay will you read it and I went like sure and then we made his his movie and um and so I met like their friends and their friends and their friends were actors and they put them all in it and it was like you could see how they were all kind of building on each other's talents and so community if you have one now and you're lucky enough to have one use it use it use it because somebody's going to get a gig that's going to put all of you in a better position the other um thing is when you're when you're lucky enough to work on something, yeah, be, reach out, you know, meet people. Like, let's say you're interested in production design and you get a job as a PA it, because that's, you know, you get, you're going to be the script copier person um, and that's your job. First of all, that's an important job, even if it feels like a shitty job, because every machine has a screw in it and a nail and a thing in it for a reason. And the home machine doesn't work when you take out that tiny little one screw. So even if you feel like I'm insignificant and it doesn't matter that I'm here, it does because the whole system works um, off of this, you know, Rube Goldberg type collection of people. Um, and so you need to, can, you know, value that. But, but let's say you're there and you're like, oh, wow, God, art department, that looks so cool. I'm going to go speak to that set decorator and ask them, how did they get into it? How, how did, what do you do? What do I do next? Oh, maybe on the next thing I can be a, a set PA for the art department. And then you start doing one that you're going to pick up, you're the prop picker upper and dropper offer, but you get to meet the art director. And the next one you say, oh, can I work? again on your team and that's how you do it there's a there's a um there's a kind of combination of being aggressive but not the icky kind of aggressive like i use the word opportunistic but that can have a negative connotation but i don't mean that i mean being strategic and opportunistic so that you're getting something for you but you're also offering something to someone who needs it. It's the difference than going like just shoving your way in there. It's sort of like, 
oh, okay. And I used to do stuff for free all the time for people. Like on the weekends, I'll help you. I'd meet a, uh, these video artists I work with in New York. They had no money. I would go, hey, I'll PA for you. I'll t- type your scripts because we didn't have computers. Uh, I'll go to Kinko's and get it copied for you. I'll do all of that. Um, and because of that, I became somebody that they relied on. And then as there, as things happened, they would go, oh, yeah, let's get Debbie. She'll help us out. She's good, you know. And so there was definitely some volunteering that went on. Um, and just like a lot of extra stuff. But, but. It's, but I think also going after the things that you love, like if you're interested in sports, then don't go work for a game, a game show. You know, if you're interested in serious drama, then don't work on um, a kid show about, you know, whatever, bunny rabbits. Like, I mean, like try to target that's what I mean by being strategic every experience will teach you something no question and you might not be able to be that selective when you start out but if you kind of just keep your eye toward the thing that excites you that's really kind of what I did I was like I like that I don't like that I like that I don't like that I I I just want to do that and try to get near it yeah does that answer the that answered about 40 questions I think sorry Even better, 40 for the price of one. (laughs) Um, Let's go back to to sort of the beginning of your career because that's that's a really interesting bit and that's where a lot of people are at, you know. How do you suggest maybe moving from a TV station the way you did to a network? Because that's a step where a lot of people could get stuck. But I guess also a secondary question too is in, in light of, you know, a lot of things being produced outside of that paradigm perhaps, is that still relevant of a jump for folks I don't to make? think it is, honestly. I mean, I, I, I think, unfortunately, I think it's harder for, for uh, your generation, I'm sorry to say. I mean, this was like, oh yeah, you get out of college and you get a job. And then it, it didn't occur to you that you wouldn't. Like it wasn't, it wasn't as hard. So I, A, you have my sympathy, my, th- my thoughts and prayers. <laughs> but um, but <laughs> B, um, I would just say um, that I don't think the model's the same, but I do think, um, it always helps to know somebody. It really does, especially in show business. It's not like they have job fairs like they do for banks and law firms and engineering companies where you get offered something. You have to kind of just stick yourself in the mix um, and keep talking to people. And networking is is a huge part. And if you know someone or your friend knows someone or your dad's friend's brother knows someone, don't be afraid to reach out because some people are really helpful and some people aren't helpful at all. But you might, but if you reach out to 10 people, maybe two people will make, you know, sit down with you and talk to you and give you some advice. And you never know because it, I've had it happen where it's just that day. I, I got a call from someone going like, hey, do you know someone who needs it? I, I need an assistant. Do you know anyone? And I'm like, oh, actually, this I just met this young person who seemed really, really smart. And they just graduated and they're really interested in, do you want to meet them? And it's like, it just happens like that sometimes. So I think it's a combination of generating your own stuff and not waiting not not hoping for one thing to come through, but trying to get 25 things and hope that one of them comes through. And um, yeah, it's hard. It's hard. And, um, and networking is a big part of it. And, but also depending on if you're a creator, having something to show and to talk about is so great as opposed to talking about what you're going to do, but to say, I did this and I did that and I wrote this or I made this or um, my friends and I are about to do this. You know, everybody, people, most people want to, most people in my position want to help people who are getting started. Uh, You know, there's no, you know, maybe someone who's like, 
few years ahead of you might not be as generous. They might be a little more competitive. They might be a little more territorial about the space. I don't know. I think, I actually think your generation is much more generous to each other than mine was, but, um, you know, I don't know what I was saying anymore. Sorry, lost my train of thought. But no, no worries. I don't um, know if I answered. Yeah, no, abs absolutely. And I want to maybe help people understand the difference. Um, you know, beyond the the corporate or not corporate angle. But can we help people understand the difference between a studio and a production company? A lot of people aren't clear what that purpose is of one over another. Yes, yeah. So a production company is usually run by a producer. It's a is bad robot. It's you know JJ Abrams company. It's a it's a it's a production company. These are creative people who are working with writers to develop ideas for television and film and short form and podcasts and whatever it is. Creative sort of centers driven usually by somebody who is either a writer or a director or a producer, prolific producer. And then very often those people will have what we call a deal, a, a first look deal with um, a, a studio or a network. Or now that they're streaming, some people will just have a deal with Amazon and then they develop all this stuff for Amazon and Amazon pays them a boatload of money to have assistants and development execs and then everything that they develop gets to go on Amazon. Or they have what's called, like what Sam and I have is a, first look deal where we have a studio that we have to bring everything to first that we want to take out to the marketplace. And because studios aren't, aren't buyers. They're, they're basically the production entity that has to sell. So we go to them and say, Hey, we want to take this supernatural drama out and they read it and they go, okay, we like this one. Uh, yeah, let's do it. Let's go to Amazon, Netflix, blah, 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 blah. Or um, we don't like this one. You guys can go run with it and take it out to another studio or just by yourselves or whatever you want to do. Um, so then, so there's like the people who are the ultimate, the platforms, which are networks, cable networks, streamers who buy stuff. There's the studios, which are very often in the traditional sense, and I'm talking about tele television, um, used to, used to um, finance the production and return and license it to the networks and then in return to own the, the IP because that's very valuable. So like you'll see at the end of the show, you might be watching in the old days, you might have been watching Fox, but it might say Warner Brothers Television. That's because Warner Brothers Television owns that show, pays for it, gets a license fee from Fox Network. But after it's done, Warner Brothers owns it for the rest of time and can remake it, resell it, sell it overseas, sell the format. So that's what the studio business model is for television. It's hurting right now because there's so much of a, because Netflix wants to own everything. They don't want to have a studio. Uh, the streamers are working directly with producers now. So it's a little bit, it's a more challenged business than it used to be. Or in the case of Fox being sold to Disney now, 20th is generating all this stuff for ABC, FX, who, you know, but it's then it's all stays within the family because they're not, they're probably not selling outside of the Disney universe. Same with Comcast, Universal, NBC, they're all in these big things. So yeah. did that make sense? Yeah, absolutely. And so for those of us, just to bring it a bit more um, to the tactical end of things, you know, if someone is an aspiring writer, then for them, does it make more sense to be an ass assistant at a studio or at a production company? What do you think? Uh, it, it, it's usually, sometimes it's both. I mean, it's the, a lot of times, it, it's not a better, it's like if somebody comes to me as a producer, I'm going to go to my studio and they're going to say, we want to be involved. And then they're involved with both. And I'm still the producer of the project. So your first stop usually is a production company. Um, sometimes things go indirectly to 
studios, but they're sort of interchangeable. It's just, um, you know, sometimes you go directly to the, to the platform. You just take a pitch directly to Netflix and you don't have a studio or you'll have a, ideally you have a producer partner because most of those places want to know you're working with someone who has some experience before they sign up for your idea or your show. Yeah. I mean, with movies nowadays, it's completely different. I mean, the studio movie system is struggling a lot because of, obviously, theaters, COVID, and streaming. And so that model is in, you know, hyper, hyper change space at the moment. Yeah. Where do you see things going, given that hyper change? What do you envision just kind of going to the future? And I'm sure we'll get a lot of questions around that, but I just wanted to touch yeah, on that. Yeah, I mean, you know, I don't know. I think people still want to go to movie theaters. I think that that the event movie will be the thing of the movie theaters. I don't imagine um, the Little Women and Jojo Rabbits of the world being, you know, high priorities for studios at this point, given how accustomed we are and now we've been forced to consume everything at home and how used to that we're going to be. I think it's going to be much harder for those smaller movies. Maybe we'll get back to those days where we'd go see, you know, three billboards in a movie theater. But um, I think those that's going to be a harder play I think your Star Wars, your Pixar's, your, you know, Marvel's are going to continue to dominate the theatrical space when it reopens. Yeah. Until things, until things level off. If, if, you know, we can habitualize people to going back out. But I don't, you know, I don't know how, if that's going to happen. Mm-hmm. Yeah, if we're lying, right? Um, coming yeah. back. To I, I got to address the the South Park picture in a wall one more time. Oh, um, <laughs> first of all, is you know total fangirl, but secondly, just out of curiosity, like when it comes to discovering new talent, you know, like Matt Stone and Trey Parker, for example, how are you doing that? Well, it's just it's kind of it's just kind of um, having an eye combined with with luck. You know, I mean the 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 week I started. At Comedy Central was in oh, early January. I forget the year, but Matt Stone and Trey Parker had done this little Christmas card that went viral. Viral in those days was um, a VHS <laughs> that got copied and recopied and recopied and recopied. That's right. and recopied because we didn't have any of this kind of stuff. And so um, it was, you know... George Clooney made like 200 copies and sent it to all his friends. So it was like a thing. And so I just really got my hands on it right when I started because it had just come out and I just called them and said, this is really funny. And then they came in and said, well, we've, I said, do you have you thought about this as a series? And they said, yeah. And then they pitched me the series and they pitched me the care, other characters and stuff they had thought about and they really wanted to do. And I mean, it was there. There's there's no way to know that that. I mean, some sometimes I know. I should say now in hindsight, but there's no, there was no way at that time that I had any idea that this would be this you know two decade phenomenon. I mean, there's just no way to know that. You're just trying things and some things sometimes it's the alchemy of the world and what people are receptive to at that moment and what it needs and finding like that space that isn't being used and you know so the planet sort of align both politically sensibility wise um market wise and that's not stuff anybody can control it's just it just happens um, but also, I mean, I think I personally have always been drawn to things that are a little bit harder, a little more out of the box, a little more subversive, because I know those things get a reaction. Sometimes they get a bad reaction. As South Park got, we got 
such bad, you know, we got so much pushback when that show went on the air. I mean, we were constantly fighting with parent groups and religious right. And it was, it was, an, it was such a pain. Uh, but um, I, I personally look for unique voices and that means something I probably haven't seen or heard before. It doesn't mimic something that I already feel like is out there. So, so for me, finding talent is that. It's like, whoa, that, that person directed something like, that's cool. I never saw something like that. Or that has an energy to it or a flavor or just um, it's that. It's that. It's a command of a voice of a point of view primarily. Just the same way a painter, you know, you look and they have a point of view and they have a voice. It's like you, it, it has to permeate, I guess. Yeah. That speaks to what you said earlier about making stuff, you know, make something, have something to show, put it out there. Does it make sense for you, you know, to try to find those voices from the inside? Um, So for example, if someone's your assistant, you know, typically in a job interview, what you're supposed to say is, I want to do your job. Where do you see yourself in five years doing your job? But, but typically a lot of these people are aspiring writers, actors, driver, directors, whatever. Is it okay to be upfront about your aspirations to be a writer, to be a director? If they're your assistant? Oh, yeah. I think you should be. I mean, that's it. I mean, there's so many people want to mentor people. Like, I always say to my, I, if my assistant's with me too long, I usually say, I'm kicking you out. It's time for you to move on. You can't, you can't hide behind this job anymore. You got to go chase your dreams. Like, <laughs> go. You know, I, you, it's time. You're done. I'm done with you. You're, like, repeating yourself here. Like, what do you want to do? And so I'll kick them out the door. Um, I, think, I think it's really important because then then – you know, if you give someone like some people will, some people will say, I want you forever. And then you probably don't want to work for that person. But most people say you have to give me at least a year because it's kind of pain to look for someone a year or two. And if you're willing to do that in exchange for them opening some doors for you when it's time to go, you know, I called my last assistant was the writer and I, called every manager and I sent her stuff to them and um, I called other showrunners that she wanted to be a writer's assistant and um, I did all that stuff and you know we kind of sat down about three months before she left and we worked out a plan and said okay let's see how we can move you to the next level so I mean when you do that good job most people will have the goodwill to help you. I mean, that's why a lot of people start at agencies because um, agencies are, or big management companies because you sit, if you're an assistant, you, you talk to writers, you talk to producers, you talk to directors, they're all clients, they're all calling in, all, well, writers used to, but not anymore. Uh, but, uh, and, <laughs> and then when it's time for you to move on if you decide, you know, I don't really want to be an agent or I do want to be an agent, but if I don't, I want to work here. I want to work for um, that producer who I've been talking to every day. Cause usually the assistants talk to the clients more than the agents do mostly cause they call and then you go like, Oh, hi. But anyway, so um, you build those again, you build those relationships and you say, I love the stuff they're doing. I read all the stuff they send in. And then, then your boss hopefully says, you know, she doesn't want to, he or she doesn't want to work here. So uh, can you sit down with my assistant? They're looking for a job. And then you get your foot in the door in a production company. And that's when you can start saying, oh, hey, I wrote this. And they go, really? Let me read it. And uh, it's just sort of like that. Yeah. There's no plan. Every single person has a different story. Every person. It's it's frustrating. It's not like you can go do first you do this and then you do this and then it's like law like law. It's like don't you do this and then you do this and medicine you do this and this and this and this and then you do that. We don't have any of that in show business. Just yeah. It's always you're always winging it. Even in my level, you're always winging it. 
Yeah. What can your assistants do to, to open those doors, like you mentioned, you know, to really do a good job in that one to two years? What, what do you expect from them and what can they do to impress you? That's a great question. Well, I expect them to just, first and foremost, do the, the job that I hire them to do, which is a lot of scheduling, keeping me organized, setting up meetings and appointments, and, you know, sending materials out when I need to, and, you know, like, high, it's, it's a high organizational job. For me, answering my phone, knowing when to, you know, learning who's important. The best assistants are listening in on my calls. They understand what I'm waiting for because they're paying attention so that when that person calls back an hour later, they know that I was waiting to hear from that person and that they interrupt me or they say, I have so-and-so, do you want to pick it up? They're like in on the drama with me, you know, they get it. And I have assistants who just are just zoned out, do the work, very organized, but don't have any kind of connection to what's happening. I don't like that as much. I like the collaboration. So like, oh my God, they called back. I know you've been waiting. Hold on. Let me see if I can get get her, that kind of stuff. Um, I love when assistants read and tell me if they love something. I love it. I mean, I've had assistants who just aren't interested. They just aren't. And that's okay. Hmm. But when they do and they come and they go, oh my God, I read these three things this weekend and I loved this one. I'm like, oh, really? Great. I'll read that one first. You know, tell me why you loved it. I mean, you have the opportunity to make a difference. You can be, you, if you work for somebody who's not very nice and isn't interested in hearing from you, which there are people like that, say goodbye say goodbye, you know, get a, try to get another job. But if, you know, I, that was another thing when I was young, when I saw a dead end, I knew a, a dead end when I saw one and I was like, I'm not wasting any more effort or time here. I'm just, we're just going to leave this party and go to another one. Uh, so um, that was, you know, important to be honest with yourself. Cause I'm, I'm sure you've had friends like this and you've seen people like going, no, they say if I just do one more year, they're going to let me and then they don't. And it's just, don't, Hmm. just, you know, don't bother. Uh, So anyway, the assistance. Yeah. So interest, energy, passion for what we're doing. Um, Act like you care. Even if you don't. Fake it till you make it. Um, yeah, that's a big part of it is being sort of, um, again, not undervaluing how important your job is, not undervaluing that just because you're in a, in a, um, starting place that that isn't a really valuable, essential, purposeful role because, People like me rely heavily, heavily, heavily on on assistance. And so if you're good, we're going to get, we're going to support you. Most people. Yeah, that's great to hear. And we want to move on to the subscriber portion of the show because our first question is related to that. So we're going to move on where we'll take questions from our live virtual audience. And if you'd like to hear the rest of the show, you can subscribe on the Anonymous Production Assistant Patreon page. Just go to patreon.com slash tapa, T-A-P-A.